Matthew 26, verses 30 through 56. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Look at your neighbor and say, that's a lot of nerve. <laughs> Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And then all the disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here. Look at your neighbor and say, follow instructions. <laughs> While I go over there and pray, and taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of you know that that's real powerful right there? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus and once and said, greetings, rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you come to do. <laughs> then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. How many of you know that's not the laying on hands of the elders? How many of you know that's the beginning of a beatdown? And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you not think that I can appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out as against a robber, against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me. Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. Basically, Jesus saying that 
you're doing this because I want you to. <laughs> I'm letting you do all this. You have no control. I have the control. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him. <laughs> In other words, they bounced. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Uh, we enjoy your word, Lord, and we want to obey your word. Help us, Lord God, to open up our hearts to receive your word about servant leadership. It is in the name that is above every name that we pray. Humble your servant. May I decrease as you increase. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Slap your neighbor. Tell him, give him a high five and tell him God is good. I don't want no injuries. Bishop come back next week saying what happened to my people. I don't want no trouble. <laughs> I don't want no trouble. Uh, by the show of hands, how many leaders do we have in here? Uh, actually, all of you should have your hands up. Come on now. Now this, is, now, this you might be questionable about. How many servant leaders do we have in here? Okay, okay. Well, here's some questions that we must consider. Are you a servant leader or are you a serve me leader? I think I need a Lord. Oof. Are you a servant leader or are you a serve me leader? It's easy, and this is your first fill-in. I want to tell you. I want to ask you this question. How can you tell the difference between a servant leader and a serve-me leader? And this is easy. Arrogant leadership versus leadership by example. The body of Christ must discern the difference between arrogance and confidence in God. And, and the first point says, a serve-me leader will have a hard time getting a towel and a bucket of water and washing the feet of those they lead. Not because their feet are crusty, not because they're smelly. Don't act like y'all ain't never put powder in your shoes. <laughs> not because they're smelly, but because they do not want to assume a position of humility to serve the ones they lead. It's simply because they are not humble enough to get into a low posture, a posture of humility, and serve someone they feel that they should be serving them. Here are some of my thoughts. I've learned throughout 16 years of ministry at CRCC and serving Bishop McLeod that as a leader, my focus should be centered on Christ and not man. If my focus was on man and not God, I would have been certain to fail. This means in order for a great servant leader, my spiritual priorities have to be in order. I've learned by watching people with the wrong motives serve to be seen, serve for recognition, or serve to get close to the senior pastor. And I want you to know, if you're a visitor and you want to join this church and you join in this church just to get close to the senior pastor, you will be exposed over a period of time. Do I have a witness in this place? God has a way of protecting CRCC, and I'm not bragging about it. I'm just saying that the Lord has his way of protecting this house. Because of the faithfulness, because of the Lord's faithfulness, this type of behavior will get exposed over a period of time. Although we as leaders are called to serve the body of Christ, we must be very careful not to serve with the wrong motives in our hearts. This is part of watching our spirits, y'all. Can I get an amen to that? As servant leaders, we have to realize that Christ is the head of the church. When we desire to serve, it shouldn't be to receive glory for ourselves from any leader, but from a heart that deserves to receive, to, but from a heart that, that desires God to receive all the glory. But when we get caught up in our selfish tendencies and a leader doesn't give us the recognition or the praise we think we deserve, 
when things are not going our way, there will be confusion. There will be conflict. There will be competition. And there will be chaos. And the Spirit of the Lord cannot dwell where there is no order. Y'all say that with me. Where there is. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God, read that with me, come on. It says, It's not a God, but... Do I, I don't have to elaborate on that, y'all. Do I? For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Therefore, a servant leader must always maintain a manner of watching, praying, and serving. This will keep your spirit in check and connect it to the local body in unity. Oh, hallelujah. And what I did here, I did a little backtracking. I want to do a little backtracking so that we can make sure that we're not going out of context here. Uh, So let's do a very quick synopsis. It's a very quick synopsis of what happened previously before Judas's betrayal, before the praying in the garden and before uh, uh, Peter's denial. In the previous verses, we see that Jesus sits down to eat the final Passover meal with his disciples here. And Jesus said to them while they were reclining at the table, he, he had actually said to them that, they will betray him. And as the meal continues, uh, he institutes a tradition by which is his sacrificial death being memorialized. And we call that what? The Last Supper. But there are some key things that happen here that grab my attention, and we'll expose some of that as we go further in the lesson. But there are some key things that happen here that we need to consider. Now let's pick up from the scripture from the verse 30 here. Here are some lessons that we can learn from the disciples. Now please notice that I said this is something that we can learn. I'm not saying you, I'm saying we, this includes me, this includes pastors as well, okay? Verse 30, I'm gonna read it too, I'm gonna gonna go over it again. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will fall away because of me this night. Now, what's going on here? Basically, Jesus is letting them know that y'all need to begin to watch your spirits. He says, for it is written, look at your neighbor and say, the word of the Lord never returns void. He says, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him. He said, though they all fall away because of you, listen to these words, I will never fall away. And it seems to me right here that uh, Peter threw his boys under the bus. Or do I have a witness? What he should have done was listen to the words of Christ and repent it for what he was going to do and followed him all the way to the cross. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night, you say you will never fall away. But Jesus said, this very night, this very night. This very night, before the rooster crows, not one, not two, but how many times? So, so this man said, I will never fall away, but Jesus said, you, wait a minute now, you're not going to deny me just once. You're not going to deny me twice. But you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples, they followed him. They followed what he said. Now, is it me or is Peter in this scripture here showing a lot of arrogance? 
Have you ever actually been into a church where you felt the arrogant spirit? Prayerfully not this one, because this is not what we do. What happens is one person feels arrogant. This is my ministry, and this is what we do in my ministry. And, you know, they, their language is my, my, my. And then all of a sudden, that same spirit starts passing on to other people with inside that ministry. This is exactly what you see here with the disciples. Peter said, very arrogant, I must die with you. I will not deny you. And then guess what happened? All the disciples say, wait a minute now, I want some attention too. I'm going to say the same thing. That same arrogant spirit began to flow throughout them. So this is what gives us the first lesson here. Here's lesson number one. Our leader needs humble service because it honors Christ. Our leader needs humble service because it honors Christ. Let me say this. When a person doesn't actually serve in the local body, it's either one or two things. It's either they've been hurt in a previous church and they have a wound that has not been healed. They're new in the ministry and they don't trust anyone yet, so they're just watching. Amen? Amen? And it's a heart issue where they really don't want to be doing anything, and you better not ask. Which brings me to point one, point A. Our humble service includes what? Pastor Wilson, can you help me here? Our humble service includes checking our mirror. Pastor Wilson said he's my mirror bearer today. When we look into a mirror, what is our purpose for going to the mirror? Oh, yeah, somebody said reflection. Who said that? You'd be all right. To see our reflection. There's a purpose for this mirror. Is to give you an image back. Also, to fix yourself up. To make sure you don't have nothing hanging in your nose. To make sure that you got nothing coming out your eyeball. Hey, hey am I keeping it real? Brother John, am I keeping it real? Make sure that your clothes tight. Make sure you're looking good. Then I take this. Can you, can you hold that up for me, sir? And I look in this. This is supposed to give me a reflection of who I am, too. Can I get a witness in this place? So I'm looking at it. I'm reading the word. You're supposed to be a husband of one wife. Uh. Honor your father and mother. <laughs> what does it say? What, what, what? Oh, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. But why is it we make changes when we look in this? And we go into the word of God, we make no changes. What is wrong with us? And in actuality, church, when you begin to make changes in here with the word of God, your, you look into here and your reflection will be changed as well. Spiritually, this will change you. Physically, this will change you. Do I have a witness in this place? Thank you, sir. I know your arms are tired, sir. I'm sorry. But why is that? 
Why is that? It's because when we look in here, we're looking from the physical. But this word of God, and I'm going to read the scripture in a minute. But this word of God is telling us. You look into the word of God and see your reflection. You have to make a change. There's no if, ands, or but about it, but you have to change. Thank you, Pastor Wilson. Y'all give Pastor Wilson a hand, please. What it is is that we are evaluating ourselves. Somebody say evaluating. In Matthew 26, 30 through 35, Peter missed his opportunity to become strong and become victorious. How? It was because he let his pride get in the way and boasted instead of listening to the words of the Lord. James 1, 20 through, 22 through 23 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he was, he's like a man who looks intently, meaning eager attention, at his natural face in the mirror. And James shows us and compares the word to a mirror. The word of God reveals what we are on the inside opposite of what a mirror reveals of how we appear on the outside. And when we as Christians look into the word, it should give us a reflection of how God sees us. And we should examine our hearts and confess our sins. It's not enough to look into the word and read it, but we should obey what we read. Need to make adjustments on the inside. And that will change how we look on the outside. Jesus told the disciples while partaking of the Lord's Supper that one of them will betray him. He told them that. And this was the first warning for them to be watchful and praying that their spirits will be in check. They begin to examine themselves at first. In other words, they begin to look in the mirror and they try to look past what the natural eye could see. And for a moment, each of them were watching their spirits. And listen to this. Once the Lord exposed them, who was, who, once the Lord exposed who it was going to betray him, which was Judas, they quickly stopped being watchful of their spirits. And because of this, they will all betray him later on as well. And when I look into the mirror and in, in, in the word of God, I, you have to see some kind of reflection of what God sees and make adjustments according to God and not according to ourselves. Do I have a witness in this place? So now I have to begin to look in the mirror. There was once this great prophet that said, I'm talking about the man in the mirror. What you laughing at? I'm asking him to change his ways. No message can be any clearer. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look. Now see, y'all not saved out here. Y'all wasn't supposed to go there with me. This might be the last time y'all see me up here. Lord, help me. <laughs> Forgive us, Lord. <laughs> but this is the truth. For a moment, each of them were watching their spirits. And tell your neighbor, look. Tell your neighbor, look. Watch. Because if we're not careful, if we're not careful, say it with me. That could be us. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians 6. 1 through 10. Are y'all okay? Galatians 
Galatians 6. If you're there, let the church say amen. If you're sure you're there, say amen again. <laughs> and it says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgressions, you who are spiritual should beat them down. Oh, that's not what it says. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgressions, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Now, what Paul is saying here is that those who live by the Spirit should restore those who sin with the gentleness of humility of the Spirit. Not acting in a spirit of arrogance or superiority. And what Peter showed was arrogance and superiority. The Bible says here, keep watch on yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, keep watch on yourself. Least you too be tempted. In other words, Paul is saying to the Galatians, they need to watch themselves and be humble so that they're not getting the satisfaction off of other people's problems or shortcomings to build themselves up. He said, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Basically, these burdens that, he, that Paul is talking about here are, are, are failures, temptations, testing, trials, and tribulations. That means instead of us standing off and anticipating on the suffering of our fellow man, we should run to their side and help them in every way possible. Somebody say amen in this place. Verse 3 says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he does what to himself? This is why we have apostates in the kingdom. And now, what apostate is, that means the abandonment of the faith. Because they, they were deceived in thinking that they were saved when they really weren't. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Sometimes, family, it's good to send an email or send a word of encouragement to your bishop or your pastors because we feel like we beat you down so much with the word of God, even though we're supposed to do what we do. We're supposed to read it to you. We're supposed to give it to you. But it's hard. It's hard. And it's hard. Just like when you discipline your children, it is very hard to discipline those that you love. But you know that you do it for the benefit of them. So Paul is actually telling them here, look, you know, I, I need some encouragement. You know, you know, send me some letters. Let me know how, how, how I'm doing and how you're doing. Because <laughs> I need it. He's, he's human. Do I have a witness in this place? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows. That will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows from the Spirit, sows to the Spirit, will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We see here that Paul urged the Galatians not to have favorites by doing good works for some people and not others. That means if I loan you some money because you and I are close and I see a brother down the street that needs some money, and I say, no, nah, I don't have anything. I'm picking and choosing who I bless. Because I have a relationship with you? No, you have a relationship with Christ. So you're supposed to do all things 
to bless Christ. B, our humble service includes taking the lowest position. Our humble service means to take the lowest position. How many of you are familiar with basketball? In, in basketball, as you can see, I wasn't a center. As you can see, <laughs> I wasn't a power forward. I wasn't a forward. But when I played, I was either the shooting guard or the point guard. Now, as a point guard, you have a responsibility. And what the point guard is responsible to do is to serve the other four players, pass, them, pass the ball to them. Now, when I played, I can't say I did that all the time. <laughs> but there should be no reason why a point guard is scoring 30-some points a game and everybody else is barely in double figures. It's one of two things. You need to get you some more big men that are effective or you need to pull the point guard back into his place, into his position. And what the point guard does is serves the ball to them and he makes the plays. He's the general on the court, the general on the court. He is to stay in his position in order for the whole team to be effective. Do I have a witness in this place? In Matthew 20 and 28, 20 through 28, James, John, and their mother failed to grasp Jesus' previous teaching on rewards and eternal life. I'm talking about our humble service includes taking the lowest position, even though a point guard is effective, even though he's the leader of that court. He still has to stay in his place in order for the team to work. They fail to understand the suffering they must face before living in the glory of God's kingdom. The cup was the suffering and the crucifixion that Christ faced. Both James and John would also face a great suffering. James wouldn't be put, would be put to death for his faith, and John would be exiled. Matthew 20 and 24 says, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. The other disciples were upset with James and John for trying to grab the top positions. And sadly, all of them, not just one, all of them wanted the top positions. But Jesus taught them that the greatest person in God's kingdom is the servant of of all. Somebody say servant of all. Matthew 20, 25 through 28. James and John wanted the highest positions in the kingdom. And Jesus told them that true greatness comes in serving others. Verse 26. Must be your servant. Serving each other is a strange statement to us. It's very strange. But it is reflecting a distinct characteristic of Jesus's ministry. And why is this a strange statement? It's because we would much rather be served than to serve. Do I have a witness? Godly leadership expresses itself as a willingness to become a servant to others, not by exercising authority or behaving with a controlling spirit. Authority is given not for self-importance, amb ambition, or respect, but for useful service to God and his creation. It's used to glorify God. You want to know how to get a top position, you must serve. You don't serve with the heart to get something in return. You serve because that's what God has called us to do as servants. In most businesses and institutions, they measure greatness by high personal achievement. But in Christ's kingdom, service is the way to get ahead. The desire to be on top will hinder you. Rather, seeking to have our needs met, look for ways that we can minister to the needs of others 
And don't be overtaken by pride. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be overtaken by pride. And this brings me to point C. Our humble service includes watching our pride. If we are not careful, our pride will make us vulnerable to falling. It will make us vulnerable to falling. Proverbs 16, 18 says this. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is a characteristic of fools, y'all. And it leads to disgrace. Now, how do I know this? It's easy because Proverbs 11 and 2 tells me that when pride comes, then disgrace comes. But with the humble is what? Wisdom. 1 Timothy 3 and 6 says this. Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Here we have Paul giving Timothy instruction on appointing elders. They couldn't have a hint of pride in them. In these two passages, we see that pride will make us vulnerable to falling, and humility is the element to have victory over sin. And guess who showed that themselves? Jesus showed himself that we, it doesn't matter who you are, must be careful not to be prideful. We're talking about the creator of everything, the creator of all life, came down, allowed his creation to beat him, spit on him, rip his flesh apart, and hang him on a cross, all so that he can save us. And we the ones that beat him. It was in his purpose and his will. Peter 5, 5 and 6 says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject of the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the, at the proper time he may exalt you. So we see here that God's grace comes from humility. Humility comes when I stop thinking so much about myself and begin to focus on serving God and his people. Peter warns his audience to be humble so that judgment may go well for them. Now, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Then Jesus went with him to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And walking with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Lesson two, whether we like it or not, our leader will select a certain few. <laughs> Can I get a witness in this place? We all need to know our positions. Some people are not going to be able to handle the leader in his weakness because there will be some people that will try to be around him to build themselves up off of his weakness. I'm sorry. Jesus took his disciples to the garden and told the disciples to sit while he went to pray. But he selected Peter and the sons of Zebedee to go with them. Peter and the sons of Zebedee were no more qualified than the other disciples, yet God had a purpose for them. Likewise, when your leaders select individuals to serve, they do so with a purpose in mind. In other words, when people are selected before us, that does not mean that they're more qualified than we are. It does not mean that you've done something wrong, but maybe, just maybe, because they're chosen by God with a purpose in mind. C, it's not our place to determine whether others deserve a position or blessings. It is the Lord's decision. And in most cases, the Lord tests our heart when he tells us to wait. <laughs> in other words, Sometimes the Lord will use situations like this to test our hearts. Even if the, purpose, the person that is selected has the wrong motives, we have to understand that God is sovereign. God is faithful. God knows all things. We know nothing. In Matthew 20, 24, when the ten talking about the 10 out of the 12 disciples, heard about this, they were indignant. They were mad with the two brothers. 
The other disciples were upset with James and John for trying to grab the top position. Sadly, all of them wanted to be the greatest. But Jesus taught them that the greatest person in God's kingdom is the servant of all. Verse 38, then Jesus said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Lesson three, our leader will feel overwhelmed with what God is calling him to do right now. In the position where CRCC is going, I feel it at night. Bishop feels it at night. Sometimes there will be sleepless nights, people. Where we're going, we are becoming more New Testament than you think. 2638 says, watch with me. The Greek word for that is Gregorio, meaning to, to be awake, to be watchful. It is also used in Matthew 24, 42. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. In Matthew 25 and 13, watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. But what this is, is stressing the importance of cautiousness. B, it seems as if the Lord was telling them to stay awake spiritually as well as physically. He was telling them to watch their spirits and pray that the enemy won't use them to thwart the plan of God. That's why it's important for us to watch ourselves, y'all, so that we may not thwart the plan of God, even though we might not like what is going on, even though we might not like where the leadership is going. We might not like these things, but if you cannot, re if you cannot beat it or, or go against it biblically, then it might be a chance that the Lord is leading. Do I have a witness? See, spiritual warfare requires spiritual weaponry. Second Corinthians, it says this, I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble, when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Ephesians 6 and 10, I love this one. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm, stand therefore having Fasten the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes fit your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That means praying at all times in the Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. With all prayer and supplications to that end, keep Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Hallelujah. This man that you see up here is going into battle. What would happen if he did not have that helmet on? What would happen if he didn't have his shield? What would happen if he didn't have any of that armor on? 
D, we have to be vigilant. Leave that up there, sis. We have to be vigilant because God is beginning to move CRCC into its pattern house position. God is going to change. I truly believe this. God is going to change our influences so that our voices will be heard prophetically. This cup of suffering, E, in times of suffering, people sometimes wish they knew the future or wish they could understand the reason for their suffering. We learn from Christ that God is glorified in our suffering. What will you do, CRCC, when the leadership and when Bishop calls you to pray fast and guess what? And suffer with our leader. What does it take to say as you will? It takes firm trust in God's plans. It takes prayer and obedience each step of the way. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 to 13 says this. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. No temptation has overtaken you. That is not common to man. God is faithful. Y'all say that with me. God is faithful. One more time. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. In verse 13 here, we see that no temptation has overtaken you. And goes on to say that God is faithful and, and, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Please believe that. Y'all, please believe that. Do y'all believe in the word? Please believe it. Because the scripture shows of God testing the faith of his followers. He did so with Abraham when he was about to sacrifice his son Isaac. And another example is how, he, he, uh, how God allowed Satan to tempt Job. Just this week, Mess been going on with me at my house. Stuff breaking down. I'm trying to prepare a message. Spiritual warfare is real. It's not what you see on TV. If you want a real thriller, <laughs> testing can build faith. And character. Testing can build faith and character. The limits placed on temptations in this context indicate that God can use temptation as a tool to strengthen believers. Matthew 26, 40 through 54. And he came to the disciples and found them. Found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd and swords and clubs, and the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given him a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send, more, send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Lesson four, we cannot afford to spiritually sleep. We cannot afford to be 
spiritually asleep while our leader is doing all the praying. Look at your neighbor and tell them, to don't, don't be a sleepwalker. It's possible to be unconscious. It is very possible to be unconscious when we are awake. How many of you ever drove down on the interstate and you got to your destination and don't remember half the stuff you passed going to your destination? Do I have a witness in this place? Sometimes we see our leaders walking around smiling like life is all good, but don't have a clue with what's going on in their lives. They need prayer, too. Jesus brought Peter and the sons of Zebedee for emotional support and testing in preparation for what lies ahead. Jesus went to a secluded place to pray, and he asked his disciples to pray also, but they failed to recognize the urgency of the situation and fell asleep. Here we see they were spiritually unconscious of what was going on. C, Matthew 26 and 41, you may not enter into temptation. Jesus indicates that the disciples need to remain watchful to avoid temptation. Jesus used Peter's drowsiness to warn him about the kind of temptation he would soon face. The way to overcome temptation is to keep watching and keep praying. Watching means being aware of the possibilities of temptation, sensitive to the details, and spiritually equipped to fight it. Because temptation strikes where we are most vulnerable. We can't resist it alone. Prayer is the essential because God's strength can store up our defenses and defeat whose power? Some of Peter's mistakes here. He was sleeping when he should have been praying. This is straight-up lack of preparedness. What's the first thing that Christ said that you're to do if you were to come after him? You're supposed to deny yourself, and Peter failed to do that. To deny ourselves means looking at ourselves as nothing, forgetting about ourselves. The next point, he fought when he should have surrendered. Now, Peter finds himself later, himself later denying the one who he was trying to defend. What is the second thing that the Lord said to do if you want to come after him? That's right. What? Take up your cross. And he failed to do that. The next point, Peter fled when he, should, when he said that he would what? Each man affirmed that they would die for Jesus, but later flees. Peter says, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. I have a question. If we say that we would die for the gospel or die for Christ, should we pick and choose how we should die? When Peter cut the soldier's ear off, it showed me he wasn't afraid to die, but because he was fleeing, it showed that he wasn't prepared. He lost confidence in Christ. The Lord said, if one was to come after him, they would need to follow him. So Peter boasted and didn't realize the words of Christ. Lesson five. Our leader needs our commitment to the ministry. Peter was trying to prevent what he saw as defeat. He didn't realize that Jesus had to die in order to gain victory. Jesus teaches us true commitment here. He demonstrated perfect commitment to his father's will through faith and obedience. The more you are committed to serve, the closer you will get to Christ. You have to stay connected. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Jesus said, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. The cross of Christ is a great stumbling block for all of us, y'all. The cross he bore for us and the cross we are called to bear for him. And in Matthew 26, 56, it says, then all the disciples left him and fled. Here we see they abandoned Jesus and betrayed him. He drew Peter close to him so that he, Peter, could see his own heart. Peter's heart was not where Peter thought it was. Peter denied Christ three times before the rooster crowed and as the Lord predicted. And it wasn't until he was restored by the Lord by asking him three times, do you love me, before he truly broke. The best part about this CRCC is that the disciples were restored 
other than Judas because Judas had fulfilled his purpose. You must establish trust in your leader. After trust has been established, you must develop faith in your leader. When faith has been established, true allegiance will follow. CRCC, my goal today was to share with you, Travis, you can come forward, it was to just share with you a key to successful ministry, and that is serving only for the glory of God and no other reason. When we do this, everything will fall into place. If you're not serving in any way, I urge you to get connected to a ministry and make a commitment. If you're a visitor, I would urge you to get connected with a ministry and serve. I would urge you on this day to have honor and respect for our leader, for our leaders. If you haven't, begin to pray for him. Begin to pray for him. And when you pray for him, watch for your spirit. Watch your spirit. Say positive things about him. Bless him with your time, talent, and treasures. And learn to walk in submission. Friends, this is only a portion of what it will take to begin a servant leader's walk. Y'all say these three words for me before I sit down, before we go. Watch, pray, serve. Again, watch, pray, serve. One more time, watch, pray, serve.